So, Professor Palazzo, thank you for uh, accepting my invitation about discussion of ethics and chat GPT. For the viewers who don't know you yet, can you just give us some presentation words? I'm Guido Palazzo. I teach business ethics at HEC, so the Faculty of Business and Economics uh, at the University of Lausanne. So, as you know, since last November, a bombshell fell on uh, with ChatGPT, OpenAI deciding to put their tools from beta version to, to everybody. And that's a bit something that rocked our community. What were your first thoughts about that situation? Well, the first thing that I did was I went onto the chat uh, bot and I entered some of the questions I asked my students uh, in the master program when they have to write essays. And the results were impressive. So I would probably struggle to figure out whether this was written by a student or by a chatbot. I mean, the quality would probably not be enough to get a six, but to easily survive the course with no work. Um, and that I found uh, impressive and frightening at the same time. The second thing was, I was thinking back at how we react whenever there is a change in information technology. The famous dialogue between uh, Socrates and uh, Phaedrus. Uh, Plato, Plato writes about this and, he, and he, he, he reports how Socrates warns against um, the invention of writing, arguing that the young generation will lose their ethics and they will lose their ability to learn by heart, which is true. So we lost something when we started to write, but we gained something, the ability to think in an abstract way. And the same happened again when book print came up. So there is this knee-jerk reaction first to say, well, this is bad, this is dangerous, we shouldn't do it. But then over time, we realize there's something we can get out of this. What we can get out of this uh, chatbot um, uh, remains an open question, but we can see some first results already. Think back at how this um, um, Go game was automized when this chatbot was, or this AI technology was uh, developed called AlphaGo by, by Google, I guess. And it was beating a European master, uh, five to zero, what was considered impossible before. So this guy was number 633 in the world. And he was beaten five to zero, which was not the most interesting thing for me. The most interesting thing for me was what happened afterwards. Because this master, he jumped up to the top 300. And he argued afterwards that he learned from the AlphaGo. So what I think is a big mistake that we make today is to think it's us against the machine. What we might look at rather is the cyborg version, so the combination. How can it make us stronger? So this is what I think um, is passionate, makes me passionate about, about the chatbot discussion. I think it can us make us stronger as scholars, as students. But are, are there any danger? Because people are complaining in Google and other, other technical sphere that those technology has been developed for years. And people say, you release it too quick. You release it because you want to be first in the market. And what about the danger of releasing a technology without completely understanding its limits and its danger? Yeah, I mean, I'm already happy that we have this discussion because until recently we just sleepwalked into new technology and then we're surprised by uh, negative outcomes. Um, to have this discussion is important. There are risks, um, and just to mention a few, one risk is um, that there is uh, inbuilt discrimination, racism, um, um, stereotypes, because it, it is nurtured by our text. So when we are uh, using it, we see a mirror. And that might create also situations where people become victims of the chatbot um, by being harassed, by being uh, singled out, by being zoomed in for uh, some negative information. That's one thing. Then there is this ability to, to uh, ventilate conspiracy theories to invent new ones. Um, then there is this risk that we are drowning in texts. Um, we are already drowning in texts today, but this will multiply by probably a number we cannot imagine. Uh, what does it do with us if we drown in text? It's, we are struggling to get an overview already today. Then you can imagine situations like um, a public discussion, political discussion, where instead of you finding your arguments, I find my arguments, we both ask chatbot. And the public discussion turns into chatbot against chatbot. What does that do with democracy? Um, and the last point we have to, to think about is uh, these tools are owned by private companies who want to maximize profits. And not only that, they want to be the only one. So this is a zero-sum competition, um, which gives power, a huge power, to some actors over 
how our society develops. So the question we have to ask is how do we get back democratic control over the chatbot? And I guess also democratic control of the information which is produced with the help of people because private data, private thoughts are also something people are trying to gather and to own. So maybe making that AI stronger by alimenting it and feeding it with our thoughts is also another way to hold more power into knowledge. It uses all the text you produce. So in a way, it, it is constantly violating my and your property rights um, because we produce those texts and they become an element of, of the story it tells. Um, so that, that is something which is not new because the property right question about data is, is already coming up with all the social media, but it reinforces that problem. One important question as well is that such technology has to put on kind of a educated hand as well. And of course, scholars and specialists have that educated hand. But what's the danger in throwing those in the student hand? Because they already are struggling with the fact of determining which information is true or not, which information is ethical or not. So is it not a danger of them actually using it just to produce quick information and not trying to have a critical point of view or critical aspect of what is produced? What should we do yeah. with our students for that? I mean, they do this already, and we do this already. I mean, this, the search for information has shifted from trying to find the most precise thing that is probably written down in the Encyclopedia Britannica 30 years ago to having a more or less plausible idea of something wherever I am and at any time. So it's a shift on what kind of information we are looking for. We are making a trade-off between quality and speed. And, and availability. Um, so we are no longer caring about the best quality. Um, and that is a danger because this is also how the chatbot works. It's not producing truth, it is producing plausibilities. So in a way it acts like us, we, we, we produce plausibilities. When we discuss, I have to make assumptions about that what you say is, is right, that what, how you present yourself is true. So I cannot check that all the time. So we, we scan the room for plausibilities, for, for having a network that then makes me believe in something. That's what the chatbot does as well. So in a way, it's again a mirror of who we are. Um, and students have to understand this, that this is not producing truth. It is inventing titles of papers um, that, that sound so convincing because the authors exist, um, the topics exist, but the paper has never been written. It's just made up by the chatbot. Um, so we can use it to reinforce in the cyborg way um, our own expertise already. But if you have no expertise, using it is, is challenging. I guess with regard to the students, the other big problem is the cheating. How do we deal with that? So, and, and I see two options how we can deal with a chatbot. One is to forbid it and then create a huge system of control around the students, which I think doesn't make sense. Um, and the other one is to let them use it but to adapt to that situation. So to teach them how to use it and, and to learn as teachers how we can make the best of this cyborg student chatbot. And what's the challenge for teacher in com in, when it comes to instructional design? Because you mentioned earlier, you, you check the chatbot, so you input in some question of your, of your exam and you were surprised that actually, yeah, those would not be great answer, but they would be just flat enough for the four and for the passing of the class. So what would be your, your advice to, to yourself first and also maybe to, to uh, a point of view you'd like to share with colleagues who ask themselves the same question. Can I still assess my course the same way and how can I actually create an ethical framework around the use of AI in my classroom? Yeah, what I did when I saw that it is able to reproduce good answers to some of my questions, I was trying out what happens if I vary my questions a bit. And you can easily find at a certain point that the chatbot has limits. There are things it cannot do. And we can use that to change the way we, we ask questions. And in fact, it also makes the, the learning experience better because we have to ask deeper. We have to get more into the imagination. Just to give you an example, or a few examples. One thing chatbot cannot do is it cannot make a link between two texts that I choose. For instance, I ask chatbot, can you make a link between an argument made by George Orwell in his novel 1984 and an argument Václav Havel makes in one of his essays on post-totalitarianism? 
and the chatbot was lost. So if it's not a usual thing to combine these two, if it's something that is difficult to find online, it cannot do it. And since I use both text in my, in my class, of course I will ask students to make links. So making links between different things, that's something it, it, where it had limits. Also, if you drill into details that are not so much discussed online. So I asked for a word that is used by Václav Havel in this essay, Panorama, which is key to understand his uh, idea on ideology. And chatbot again was lost. Didn't know anything about this. So there are ways of how we can um, not, I wouldn't say avoid the cheating of students, but make their use of chatbot an advantage for learning. Uh, by changing our questions. What we can no longer do is just asking them to repeat stuff uh, that is out there. You can ask the, the chatbot, give me the three typical reasons why discrimination happens in organizations. Five seconds, you have the result. Give me three ways of dealing with that. You have the result. So these questions you cannot ask anymore. But making surprising links, that's possible. And the third thing you can do is you can just connect the course, the session, the discussion uh, to, a, to an essay question. Because as soon as it's a discussion chatbot cannot listen to or doesn't have in written, it cannot make a link. And the fourth element is you just let students work on something that is just this these days in the, in the news. Chatbot cannot do this either. Not yet. It's yes. limited so far. I mean, yes. uh, Google promised with this brand new tool that it's been connected to straight away with all information on the web, but yeah. we haven't seen but that happening. But it will be difficult. And even if, they, if it works, then still is that text that I refer to that was in the news today already discussed sufficiently that chatbot can apply this? Um, that has to be tested. So we constantly have to test, of course, whether it's catching up. But especially if it's about creativity, I think we still have a big advantage. And again, that helps us to teach better because we can turn the students and the chatbot into a cyborg, a learning cyborg. And I also asked chatbot to, to take a text that I had asked it to produce and turn this into um, a version written by Dante Alighieri for the Inferno uh, to imit imitate that style. And it did it. But then I posted this online on LinkedIn and, and some experts told me, well, this is, looks like that, but it's actually uh, not really on the same level. Of course not. And Just cosmetic. Just cosmetic. So if I ask questions about my own domain, I will see that, uh, I guess. Um, but again, I will not see it if I'm just asking basic knowledge questions. And I cannot fail a student by telling them, I assume that was written by, by chatbot and it's not going far enough. Um, it would be enough for a, for a four. So I have to adapt as a teacher. And that's good because I also use the chatbot to learn and I want to be a cyborg improving myself with it. So. We both learn, students and teachers. Yeah, I also read somewhere in an article, I think it was the New York Times, where actually chatbot is a conversation tool. So that could be used also to train soft skills. Yes. Yeah, training for an interview as a job, conversing in English about a topic. Yeah, you would find yourself with something at the back that would answer you back. Of course, the algorithm would always try to produce tech that pleases you. But that's also a good way for our student also to, to learn things in, in terms of conversation. Yes. It's a wonderful brainstorming tool. So I can ask it, give me a structure for a presentation on something, or give me a summary uh, of how I can explain this or that scandal in, in, in one of my classes uh, on, on ethical behavior. So I don't necessarily have to use what it produces, but I can build on it, can rework it, can restructure it, and I can find a more elegant way of saying what's in my mind already. And that's good. But when it comes to cheating, let's go back to that. If we take the example of sport, for example, with doping in sports, we always seen that actually the, the pharmaceutical part is always like years ahead, the controlling part. So when it comes to the point you mentioned about it's not really an answer to just forbid things, what could be the analogy here uh, between like wanting to control everything and to check what is written with the eye, what is not, with what could happen now with actually all the software that can detect that? Yeah, I mean, a professional cyclist, for instance, has, has a lot of legal um, methods to improve their, um, their, 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 their speed or their endurance. They just go into the mountains and so they, they enrich their blood with a, a hematocrit level going up. They can do this, it's legal. Um, so, and they don't have a kind of health disadvantage. 
we don't have a health disadvantage when we use the chatbot. We improve what's in us. That's why I highlighted it's good for experts. But if you are knowing nothing about a topic and you try to elaborate it with chatbot, you will be lost because you cannot evaluate the quality. It can make you better if you know something, um, but you are groping in the, in the, in the fog if, if, if you don't know anything about the topic. So that will help us to improve ourselves in our domain um, if we work with it correctly. If we don't work with it correctly when we hide what we do, then the, the question is, where does cheating start? And that's an open question, because uh, if it's a text that has a, it it's been written by a human being, and I can find it word by word, it's obviously it's cheating, but plagiarism. But if it's a text written by a chatbot, it's invented in that very moment, and it's not invented by a person. So whose rights am I violating? Um, or is it just that I imitate being the author of something? But if I have a language editor, I also improve my text. So this is something we have to discuss as, as, as academia. Uh, where's the red line? Same goes with DPL, for example. So I write in French. I, I use DPL to have proper English to start with and to correct. Is that cheating? Should yeah. I mention that I translated that with DPL? So maybe we might make my next question. We produce syllabus for our courses. So do you plan to change yours with the apparition of uh, ChatGPT, and what would you change in the syllabus of your courses regarding the use of that? Well, I will not change my syllabus. I will write in my syllabus in the future that they can use it, um, and that I know that they probably will do it anyway. But what I will also do is I will give them samples of, of uh, answers from the chatbot to the questions I ask them, so that they can see. I know what roughly comes out if you ask the chatbot. The chatbot can vary only to a certain degree. So if I show them what I get out of this, uh, they see what I will figure out when they just use it. Um, and again, I will upscale my questions in a way that they need to think themselves. The thinking cannot be done by the chatbot. Not yet. Thank you for the conversation. It was really interesting and uh, looking forward to maybe have another session in six months. My after pleasure. the exam, maybe. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.